Hello, good morning. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Um, Gemma Pareño. Today we're going to talk about the architecture of uh, TensorFlow and we're going to dig into one uh, case, uh, use case uh, with NASA Space App Challenge. For a small introduction about myself, I am an AI developer. I work in the research and in development team at Open Systemas and currently uh, take part at uh, the data scientist uh, team in Centro Innovación BBVA. Uh, if you want to reach me by my LinkedIn or Twitter account, I'm more than welcome to reach me in my circle. So uh, before getting into uh, TensorFlow, I would like to go into uh, three main concepts about artificial intelligence. Uh, now I'm going to explain what artificial neuron is. So uh, we as a data scientists are mm, dealing a lot of with data. These data are inputs that we, we mostly give it a weight of a uh, level of importance. From that we assign what are called uh, two functions that are going to define our neuron, the transfer and the activation function. At the end, I always explain like this uh, neuron concept as such other things like this. An input, that input we are going to weight it to give it that level of importance and put two uh, functions to it. Um, when we talk about machine learning and deep neural networks, I like to say that it works kind of a cake. We design a multi-layer uh, process in which uh, in this uh, layer uh, acts as an activated neuron or a hidden layer in which we are going to process information. In this diagram, I take a picture of a cat and then I process, process it into a layer cake and then at the end, the output is going to tell me if uh, I'm working with an image of a cat or, or not. So at the end, um, okay, this uh, artificial intelligence, deep neural network uh, thing, uh, work uh, as a multi-layer process that I like to th think about it as a cake. Uh, but TensorFlow is an uh, artificial intelligence is also working with language. Uh, we as humans are creating sem semantic uh, approach uh, always with words. And with this, uh, what uh, TensorFlow does is uh, it creates arrays that talk about semantic relationship that uh, process like gender, in this uh, case, sir, madam, uh, or mother, father, or they uh, relate like uh, verbs, like I was swimming, then I swam, I was walking, then I walk. So it's like a mathematical abstraction uh, that tell us about language. So uh, TensorFlow uh, at the end is a tool that has been like the core uh, main search engine from Google during the past uh, years. And for me, uh, it has like some advantages because it has like been released um, with the type of license that it got. Now you can create like uh, projects or products with it. Um, for me, it has like four uh, main uh, core advantages. Uh, it is very flexible uh, when you are mm, getting the tensor board like representation. Uh, it can be like performed in a CPU and a GPU. That means that you can use like that graphic computation, computational hardware units to run your neural net if you're like working with with image data, or you can use like CPUs to to perform with raw data. Uh, it has like some kind of design its structure for, for a scaling because uh, the deep learning architecture that was like uh, started in the 70s uh, has been now like being like um, better or because it has been like more higher scalable for the computational power. And it comes with uh, many tools that you can dig in uh, and you can use for, for designing your, your neural nets. So uh, at the end, well, okay, uh, this is a new tool, but what for, what, what can I do with this? Uh, it is great for classification um, examples, but in that you can use like other machine learning libraries such as Scikit-Learn, Theanos Cafe. But uh, it is great for understanding the new the patterns that you that you are trying to fit in it, for discovering, and also for creating the pr the creationist uh, algorithms that are brand new are mostly like uh, designed with this kind with this kind of tools. 
Okay, so um, I've been like uh, digging into machine learning uh, models for uh, two years from now, and I uh, mostly use it like scikit-learn, well, which I think it's a brand new good tool, but it's based um, basically on that logical reasoning. It's just like naive base or linear regression. They use like that logical kind of thinking to classify data. But uh, this uh, TensorFlow um, core tool doesn't use like that logical and it's more like into that deep learning that might be considered as this multi-layer uh, process where that we were talking about, that uh, layer cake, that in, we, in this layer we are going to feed it with different uh, kind of data. So now I'm going to tell you like the three or four main cores of the of the architecture of TensorFlow. This is going to be like uh, not very dig into it. I'm going to pass like with the tips and tricks that you can use uh, for you to understand like the concepts and and the main uh, how to use the tool when you really want to dig into it in order to save you time. Uh, when we talk about the TensorFlow, for me, we have like this, these four uh, main um, architectural concepts that go from the, um, from the basic unit that could be considered like the tensor uh, to the neural net that is going to be like the main architecture of, the, of TensorFlow. Okay, so a tensor is no more than, a, than an array the, in which we are going to create uh, and put the data. The thing, that, the thing that it has is that you can like size it to to be like more co coherent and mean more like like the data we we want to to see about. So it can be like uh, okay, we have like an scalar, we have like a number. So it could rather be like a tensor of dimension zero. But we, we can scale it and we can create like this structure of data uh, based on metrics. Both are tensors and they can uh, operate in between themselves, but they have like different characteristic uh, or dimensions. Um, this is a solve into a TensorFlow class. That is the one that you uh, really like define when you're like coding in your, in your Python. When we talk about a tensor, uh, we should have like three uh, three things uh, to have like very, very clear. One of it is like the the rank that we have already talked about, which is the structure we're going to to give to the to the tensor, uh, which is the shape that we are going to make it because TensorFlow comes very straightforward model for the kind of, of data that we want to work with. It's not the same if we are uh, working with images. It's not the same if we are working with uh, vector words or word to back or raw data. You can even create like complex uh, data size that include like uh, several kind of things. But uh, TensorFlow has like this very straightforward because the deep learning model is going to work uh, very different uh, if you work with one kind of data or the other. And then uh, this type of, of data, they tell us uh, precisely that. Uh, the thing that I like uh, about this and um, that makes like better than Teano or Cafe is that uh, they already this this software architecture already know that you're going to feed the deep neural network and it's going to be overfitted, it's going to fail, and the tensor in one in one layer might not be working. And that's uh, one of the core value pro propositions of TensorFlow, that it, you can like reshape your tensor. You can like say to your data, okay, uh, maybe in this layer you should change your structure, or this, uh, this uh, raw data that I g gave you, uh, this color might be now a vector, or this word I gave you might be uh, now an array of relationship in between words. So you can save that in each uh, layer of a cake. Uh, this is a key thing uh, when we want to, to train uh, deep neural networks and we want to uh, give um, that knowledge a more, more deep um, advantage. It's, it's also uh, necessary when we are talking about uh, creation algorithms and discovering algorithms. Now I'm going to talk about the variables. The variables are those parts 
of the training that you might discover that it worked different. In case, for example, of uh, the most common of regressions, you have like the weights uh, what we have seen before or the bias. And then when you train it, uh, you might be discovered that that weight was not the level of importance that you may want it to. And also the bias, you, you at, at first you give like a level of importance to a model, and then when you train it, you discover that it was not. So uh, this is a, a special class that uh, TensorFlow has uh, put into, into this uh, parameter, uh, parameter modelization. Again, uh, when I, uh, we have like the concept of tensor, we have like the three main cores. Now we have like the variables with the other three main cores of uh, functioning, okay? Here it's very important to have like the, I, the initialization because in each layer of the cake, we're going to have those variables, okay? And it might be the ones of the previous layer of the cake or it might be different, but in each layer, we're going to initialize those variables. And we also might want to save them. I mean, um, the level of importance in a layer when we are talking about one a specific topic might be not as important in, this, in the next one. So save and restoring the, the variables is uh, very important. Again, um, I uh, like this architecture because it comes like uh, from mm, that design that you know about deep learning that is uh, problematic. Uh, we have like the graphs. I consider myself kind of visual person, and when I visualize like uh, what I'm working with, uh, it for me it's better to to understand it. So what uh, TensorFlow has is called a tensor board. In this tensor board, you can see each layer of a cake. Even it's not a pyramid here, but you can see like how is it working, and mostly how the weights and the bias that I'm giving the net is going to to be feed. Uh, so at the end, a thing that is like kind of abstract, that uh, kind of composition of design, you can have it like in a graph. So you can like see, okay, this the with the results, and that's very nice because you see, okay, this this layer is the one who is not actually working, or it might be the one who who actually does. I think like uh, Google released like TensorFlow uh, last year in November. Now they are on the 0.11 version. It's not uh, uh, the one version yet. But I have like uh, found like a lot of documentation. It's like uh, kind of messy. So now I'm going to more or less tell you about the tools that I have found more suitable and more useful. And also give you like the two, the two tricks that I wish somebody could have told me before starting with uh, TensorFlow. So if you, I have to tell you two things uh, that I wanted to uh, take from this talk. It would be those two. Uh, when we do machine learning, uh, we should think a lot about architecture in terms of structure. And we uh, should um, be consciousness about the importance of seizing the, da the data and understanding somehow what that data means, uh, what, what of that data is going to be like more crucial into the deep learning, and what kind of data is, is going to be like more like not so important because we're going to weight it. We have to assign all the data and activation function. So it's very important to more or less uh, know uh, the data or talk about with an expert about what does it mean but also to uh, think about it about like a cake. Like, okay, it's not no, a black box in which I put like all the data and then it gives you like the magic trick. It, at the end, I'm giving it knowledge from the general proposition to the output that I want to get. And it's very important to think about it, about uh, a cake and being like a uh, cake has its own order or of design. So mm, I'm going to dig into it now in the use in the in the case of in the use case, but uh, you should like have that in mind that in the end uh, it's very important to to be like have certain kind of order in this. I uh, recommend like a course of uh, Udacity that it's like a open platform for online learning. It uh, it talks a lot about. Um, 
uh, very mathematical concepts are important, such as cross entropy or the validation of the accuracy of the net. But it also gives you like the first approach to code to TensorFlow, which uh, it's kind of uh, great. Also, uh, now uh, there are like a GitHub that is already like uh, more or less like order with uh, classification and regression problems, and also like uh, some recursive uh, neural nets. And um, there are some books available. There is a, a one from a um, uh, teacher of, La Co La of, of Catalonia. It's called Hello World with TensorFlow. That is like uh, great for starters too. Um, I have also put like all the um, this talk and the main like gifs and animations in this uh, medium blog post. And uh, I would like also recommend you to to catch it on social media because uh, people is like talking, publishing, making pull requests like almost every day. Um, when we uh, we have talked about the layer cake and the process, but uh, one problem that I had when I started designing this is was uh, okay, it was like it had like a huge level of uh, abstraction. And I couldn't see uh, why the results were as it were. So um, I discovered this, that it's called TensorFlow Playground, that it's like TensorFlow Playground Dart Arch, in which uh, you can like design a neural net even before uh, having like the data and only uh, thinking about the structure of the neural net. In this, um, uh, as important things, I will tell you that we have like the activation uh, function that we talk about when we define what arti artificial neural is, and also like the kind of uh, problem that we want to to solve. And here we have like the the input that is going to to talk about the data, but it's not going to talk about the data itself, but the relationship relationship that it exists in, the, in between the different kind of data. That's uh, what I told you, that it's important to study uh, the data a little bit to see the, the, how the data works, to establish those relationships uh, in the data before um, training the net. And then here you have what it might be called like the layers of the cake, those hidden units. If you uh, play it, you could see how even the, the data flows are and how the data is moving. And in the end, it gives you like those classification problems like uh, solve. I really recommend this tool where when you, okay, I'm, go I'm even uh, before like starting to make the code a problem to say, to analyze the data a little bit. Okay, I have like this significant data, and this is the relationship in between, in between the data. Now I'm going to try uh, which neural net and how many layers and which activation function should be like the grade for it. Because if you try this by code, you're going, you might be like a lot of days and days trying different activation functions, debugging the model a lot, but here is a graphic approach uh, that you can be playing with it, and it tells you like pretty straightforward what to do. Also, if you want to to work with images and understand a little bit how the neural net sees the images and is able to classify them, I recommend you this code lab that is called TensorFlow for Poets. It's very straightforward because the Python code it's into a Docker it's not into a Docker container, so you can like just uh, run it, and you can use like uh, your own uh, photo sets to to train like the the image recognition. Okay, but um, I don't care about anything if I cannot solve a problem, make a product. And uh, what I have found in the integration of uh, products is one main thing. There are not silver bullets for making it. Uh, deep learning might be a great solution for some kind of problems, but might not be for others. So have in mind that we have like a, a huge uh, skill set of machine learning tools, and please select uh, specifically by the kind of the, the type of data and the type of, of problem that you want to solve, if uh, deep learning is your is your real answer or is your real tool for for it, because if not, uh, you could uh, this this uh, product this tool could be be lying to you, okay? And um, could be like making like uh, decisions that are not uh, really true. 
So now we're going to, I'm going to tell you about my, my experience with a uh, NASA Space App uh, Challenge of uh, this year. Basically, this is a worldwide hackathon in open, from Open NASA, in which they release what are the main challenges and the main problems they're trying to solve uh, from this year. Uh, when I when I approach them, they have like this uh, near Neos machine learning project in which they wanted to use like the Open NASA dataset to try to predict it was like if it was like a potential um, uh, asteroid that could collide uh, on Earth or have a, like a potential problem. I found it like very interesting because it was like a, a way to have like very abstract kind of data about like astronomic uh, observations and could make like a meaningful resolution. The project was among the global finalists, uh, was in the top 25 from 1,200 uh, uh, projects and was also like uh, among the first five in the best uh, use of data category. In this uh, contest, what we basically made was like use the two, three, the two tips that I, that I gave you to size the data and design that multi-layer process and was the, the, the main core design decisions that that took NASA in to give us the, the prize for the, for the project. So um, basically, uh, when we went, we, um, I um, decided to, to call like a, a group of friends, uh, mathematicians, uh, physics, and astrophysics experts that could help us and to know more about, about the asteroids. Um, at the end, like uh, we we were like f five or six uh, people that we we wanted to to create a solution or to propose a solution based on machine learning because uh, we we all we believe in the power of producing knowledge through through data, and we um we uh this, we knew that we have like the the problems that we have to measure these odds of a possible collision of uh, neo and predict this uh, potential impact um uh, when you okay uh, from this uh point i have to say that uh, there are no data of the dinosaur asteroid impact okay but we do have data about the small rain uh, meteor rain that comes like near our our earth and coming to the atmosphere and then we have like some uh, meteorite uh, rain this is a kind of significant because uh, astronomic uh, neos and astronomic uh, asteroids are traveling around the universe and they uh, they also get some dust or some mechanical pr properties that are great for studying are great for for science ad for advance on on science so we um, consider those kind of asteroids as uh, as an impact for helping also NASA to say, okay, maybe you want to to take those uh, small pieces of uh, asteroids into account for for studying. Uh, at the end, we um, we did dig a lot into different data sets that Open NASA has, and we selected two um, two important kind. Uh, one of where it was the potentially hazardous asteroids dataset. That means that uh, an asteroid is uh, going to pass nearby. 0.05 astronomical units near Earth, okay? And also the, the MOIS, the minimum orbit interaction distance, that told us like uh, uh, regarding the, the distance, uh, regarding the asteroid, it tells us like the minimum uh, kind of uh, distance they, they had. At the end, um, we found we were talking with a lot of uh, astronomical uh, institutes, like uh, Instituto Astronomico de Canarias, that had a lot of uh, images about asteroids and were like uh, making like a lot of human work to detect those those neos. So we we told them, okay, why why don't we took that image data sets with the human knowledge and we can like feed the, the deep learning uh, neural network and tell us uh, how many like neos were like like near there but also um, we were talking about about uh, a lot about the activation functions 
and if we were going to feed the net about the asteroids, how uh, we can um, we can like put the activation function to be coherent or to be like learning also about the the orbit of the of the asteroid. So we uh, we choose like uh, wave nets and like uh, the the shapes of the of some asteroids um, orbits that could like help us more or less with the with the with the design of the net. At the end, uh, it's again uh, a cake in which uh, we put like first the, that uh, mechanical data about the potential hazardous asteroids. From those, uh, we selected like those two classifications that are important uh, to um, this asteroid collision, that are the Athen and the Apollo-like um, asteroids. Then we um, uh, put another layer that, ha that talk about the time, because it happens a thing when you are this is about the data. When, when you are like observing an asteroid, you are like following it like as an ast astronomic phenomena. And then uh, when you uh, wait uh, two days, you might uh, observe that asteroid again, and you might discover that the color has changed or the velocity might change. And that's why uh, the asteroid classification might change too. That was uh, a thing that uh, that people who, who really uh, observe asteroids were very like worried about and say, that's not why a machine could could uh, replace that. Um, it's uh, that's why this has to be a craftsman uh, human work and say, okay, so let's let's design this craftsman. Um, work uh, taking two data sets of the same object and compare them themselves and feed it the net again. In the last uh, layer of the cake, we, we also use like fallen cl classification. As the asteroid comes by near the Earth, the color uh, and the, some kind of uh, chemical properties are more important. So we uh, put it like as a pruning method to see how potential hazard it was. At the end, uh, it was like a process from taking the data sets, uh, making like this uh, neo-recognizing uh, protocol, designing the first layer that I talked to you about, about the Athen and Apollo method, and evaluate it. The second layer uh, was after that evaluation, uh, having again a classification again to solve that human craftsman uh, pro program in the, in the design. Uh, so at the end, uh, we were like uh, putting time as another layer, as another mm, design approach. So uh, we were thinking that if you if you put uh, that time or that uh, retraining uh, method into a deep neural net, uh, does it mean that uh, you are you are teaching it how to deal with uh, change by design? Uh, that was like the, the best uh, maybe thought or idea that the NASA uh, liked about this project. And uh, for me, it was like a great opportunity to use machine learning to solve like a, pr a problem that could like help humanity, not only for avoid danger, but also to, um, to advance. Now I'm going to, to give you a little bit uh, short uh, demo uh, about uh, World of Warcraft. I'm a huge uh, World of Warcraft uh, fan and I always have like this uh, question about, okay, uh, if I'm uh, uh, an elf or if I'm uh, an orc and I'm in the forest, how can I like differentiate if uh, uh, I'm checking a night elf or I'm talking with a broad elf? Uh, before going into, into the demo, there is a short video in which I'm going to tell you how the neural net is uh, trained. I'm going to tell you what, what basically I did. I took like two, two folders. One of them I fit it into a lot of uh, elf, blood elf uh, picture types. And the other I fit into the night elf uh, pick types. And then um, I realized when I was doing this, I realized how uh, Google has discovered has discovered the problem of scale that uh, deep learning has. It has a huge problem, but because you need a huge amount of data 
to really get knowledge through it. So what Doodle has, uh, Google has done, it, does, it has already like trained a neur neuron, a neural net, with ton tons of tons of images in which they recognize objects, trains, and whatever. And then they release the neuron, and they give you like the final, uh, the final neuron design that is called like a bottleneck in which you label the kind of classification that you want to make with the images. This, for example, I have like the neuron from Google with uh, tons and tons of, of images, and I like train it with a uh, night elf and um, lot of types. With this, um, uh, there are two uh, mathematical concepts that are important. One is the validation accuracy. Uh, it's uh, the validation accuracy is tell us um, the 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 the, good, or sorry, the the accuracy of how well the picture was for the training. If I uh, give a uh, blood elf, say okay, this was this picture was great. I believe you in a certain percent. The cross entropy is a mathematical computation of uh, possibilities that also is a percentage that gives you like a result of how well the neural net uh, was uh, doing it. So here I uh, do have my, my virtual box machine in which uh, I'm calling like the, the Docker. What I'm doing here is I'm calling the, the already trained, oh, sorry. I'm calling here the 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 neuron that it's like um that it's given. He is receiving like of the objects and he's creating a branch for you to use to train the the layer, okay? So um here I'm calling the the Python file that has like the the neuron implemented. With the, with the retrain method. I'm telling the bottlenecks that it might have the training steps, the, the number of times that I'm going to tell the things, and the direction of the model. Also, I'm going to tell the graph, because here, like, TensorFlow works a lot with, uh, with the, the models. So here, uh, it's looking in the folders of the blood elf, and the night elf, and then it's uh, going step by step, like image by image, processing the two concepts we talked about the last time. The validation accuracy, okay, I'm believing you, this is a blood elf at 95%, and the cross entropy, how well the neural net is uh, training. Here I'm uh, teaching it with a 50 uh, model folder, so it is not a huge uh, data set, but the process is a little bit uh, slow. So here um, comes like uh, that uh, challenge of how many data uh, you have for training the net and the time that you really need to, it to be like uh, straightforward and useful for project development. So at the end, at the end it gives us like a final test accuracy of uh, 90% that it was like not not really great, but it, it converted like two variables that we uh, talk about to constants. It means that the neural net learns something that it might be like, okay, maybe uh, night elves are dressed in blue or are in blue worlds or take on blue and green worlds, and, and, and blood elves are more like red and have another type of colors. So this is important because uh, in here you learn how knowledge is uh, gathering to the mathematical function. So that's it. Thank you so much. I think we have time for some questions. You can uh, write to me if you are, want to dig into it or if you need like more help with any tutorial or whatever. Uh, please don't hesitate to email me.
Hi. Hello. Uh, you mentioned that uh, use uh, deep learning depend on the use case. Yeah. What are the key points we have to take into account to decide to use deep learning in in more enterprise uh, area? Thank you. Um, hmm. Okay. So uh, if I have to give you like an advice for this is. Uh, there, uh, first, with the data, it should be like classify and make like regression. You should have been like doing previous machine learning classification problems, like linear regression, even support Bertok machine and, and, and the trees. But um, uh, it, at the end, it depends on the, on the vertical. But uh, what I would say is uh, first try the, the handy approach and then uh, try to uh, discover, try to solve a problem in which you have to discover things that you don't know. What are called Indian analytics, what are called the exploratory analytics. I don't know if I'm, uh, if you want to, uh, if I'm asking si te estoy respondiendo o no. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> So met exploratory, all kind of exploratory metrics in which you have already made like linear, uh, linear regressions and classifications, and you want to solve like a, a problem that talks about relationship in between in between metrics. Any more questions? Well, thank you. Ah, oh, no, there's a there's a question there. Yay! <laughs> About what? Sorry. Interpretability. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, deep learning has that challenge in particular. Uh, it, it can sometimes act as a black box. That's why uh, what I will tell you is to make experiments in which uh, the question you want to, to be solved ask as an output. So the output of your neural net has to be uh, always a, a, a data that talks about the business or, prob or product problem that you want to solve. The accuracy of how well the deep model is uh, learning, it's uh, tested on the, on the testing or on the learning phase in which you have like the cross entropy. I don't rec recommend you less than 0.96, 97%. Less than that, for me, is not good because as long as you are scaling with the layers, you you could be like the error could be like um, you could be like with this error once and and, and more times. So the accuracy, the how well is learning, 0.96 minimum, okay. And the um, and the business questions, you, uh, the the thing is, uh, this is not a magic tree in which you can like put all the data and have like several answers. You have to design neural nets for, I would, I would rather say design neural nets for each question that you want to make. Is fine? Yeah. 
okay, in this second layer, I want to know about the behavior on time. Mm -hmm. And you put that information into the model before uh, collecting evidence and learning and so on. But once you have learned, yeah. can you make this kind of question to the, to the model like, uh, what, what can you tell me, uh, what the model could tell me about the behavior of the objects on time? Yes, I know, I know that if I feed uh, uh, the model with different objects, at the end, these objects are going to be, uh, are going to be of one, one kind or the other. Mm -hmm. But what, what is the model tel telling me about the, time, the, the behavior on time, uh, why, why they are different uh, yeah, according uh, to this behavior? Yeah, with that, I discover m m more things about the behavior on time. When I seize the, like, the data and make like a, a data set with how uh, the Aten asteroids were in a time and how the asteroids were in the second time, rather, in, rather than in the, in the network. That's why I told you about the cake design uh, resolution. Uh, at the end, you should design the net for solving a, a problem, a specific problem. Um, we we didn't. Uh, we 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 learn more about the the data, the, the those kind of data. But we w when we take the second layer, we prune it, okay, and we uh, we didn't learn, but we mostly teach the the net. So like this object that was like this in this way now might be in this way, and at the end, uh, what I care is to put another uh, an object of input and gives me uh, that, that classification model uh, more accurate. What we learn is that a new object was coming, and then we feed it only with the first, uh, with the first layer, and it was giving us a classification. But when we have the second layer, the classification or the accuracy was low, or it might be changing. O sea, lo que, lo, que, lo que pasaba al final es que cuando clasificábamos un asteroide con la primera capa, eh, te daba una clasificación de Ateno, Apolo, en un, ¿sabes? en un porcentaje. Y cuando lo, lo clasificábamos con las dos capas, eh, lo que pasaba era o que un porcentaje era menor o que cambiaba la clasificación, que era precisamente lo que, lo que queríamos. Sí, entiendo tu punto. Quizás podría terminar esto con una comentario sobre tu último ejemplo. Uh, at the end, hmm. the, the TensorFlow machinery doesn't inform you about why. Why is learning? But uh, for instance, uh, in, in the last example, if, if you ask me what to do, mm -hmm. I will tell you just make some kind of average of the images and put yeah. that into a color space that allows you to find a linear discriminant. And then you can ask the model because the model is very simple why. Yeah. In, 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 in when you go to, to very complex models like deep learning, you can mm -hmm. ask that, that kind of questions. I understand wha what you say. Uh, I agree that the why is maybe the most difficult uh, approach, but I believe that uh, it's worth it to feed the, the neural net with knowledge. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>